morning. Good morning. It, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. What a wonderful day is before us because we have a wonderful God who doth lead us. This morning as we focus in on our message for today and that we hear the readings, what we're going to be hearing about is faith. And it sounds simple. Only believe. But have you ever been in that situation where some difficulty arises and you're struggling with it and you say, all I need is to believe. But it's not that easy. And so today as we look at these texts and as we hear the message, God gives us a prescription. In other words, what does he want us to remember that our faith can be sure and certain and lead us unto the glories of the heavenly kingdom? Let us worship our Lord now in spirit and in truth.
beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then kneel and confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a call and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We rise. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
be with you. Seeking a homeland. 
If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Let us rise.
May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Sanctify us with the truth, for thy word is truth. Amen. Well, dear brothers and sisters in the Lord, it's good to be back in the sanctuary again, isn't it? In recent years, I've heard this phrase, no worries. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, that's a pretty new phrase. I'm still trying to get used to it. I, don't, I must be within the last three or four years. There once in a while, somebody says, no worries. Well, I always get curious about where something originates and what it really means. So I dug into it a little bit and I learned that this comes, it's an Australian English expression. And it means, do not worry about that, or that's all right. No worries. Does that sound like your life? You know, people sometimes will tell us, don't worry. And you know what comes to our mind? They have no idea what I'm going through. If they were going through the same thing, they would worry too. Now we know that worry is wrong. We recognize that worry doesn't accomplish anything except having a negative effect on our health. Doctors and psychologists tell us that one out of every three illnesses may well be connected to worry. Among the illnesses connected to worry are high blood pressure, indigestion, skin eruptions, asthma, headaches, insomnia, and rheumatoid arthritis. If that's not enough, it's rather interesting to note that the term anxious found in our text has its root in an old German word, which means strangled. When we worry, we strangle ourselves so that we can't move forward as God intended because we are so worried about getting stuff together for what might never happen. You see, we worry about the future, it doesn't happen, but it strangled us. And we haven't accomplished what God has desired. Corey ten Boom, a Dutch Christian writer, was a survivor of the Nazi concentration camp. And he wrote, Worry does not empty tomorrow of sorrow. It empties today of its strength. Pretty profound. Worry does not empty tomorrow of sorrow, but it empties today of its strength. It strangles us. That's what makes the gospel read so significant today. Because we all deal with worry. We all deal with anxiety. And the great physician of body and soul comes to us in this passage and says, brothers and sisters in Christ, you can live a worry-free life. He commands us, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. Now that's not a command that say you can't give consideration about what you might be preparing for a meal today or tomorrow. And he's not here saying, well, you can't think about what you might wear at the next big occasion you have to go to. But what God is commanding is, don't let worry strangle you. I have given you life, and I have given it more abundantly that you might move forward to bring honor and glory to my name. Don't live in fear and worry, for it will take the strength out of today. The truth is, we can strengthen.
struggle with worry, no matter what our economic status. We can worry if we have very little, but ironically we can also worry when we have a whole lot. In the Wall Street Journal, a while back there was a story about a businessman who had worried about the business he had created, which was extremely successful. He was a person who didn't need to work anymore. He had made lots of money, but he was filled with worry that his business may one day go under. The end result was that he was so stressed, he committed suicide and left behind a young wife and two young children. It is when we think we are ultimately responsible for the things of this life and we view ourselves as the great provider that unnecessary fear and worry come our way. The truth of Scripture is that God is a great provider. And He cares for us, He watches over us, He meets our needs, and He safely guides us to glory. The cure for worry, then, is not winning the lottery. The cure for worry is not getting a big inheritance or surrounding ourselves with all kinds of wealth. The cure for worry? Trust in God. Trust that God will take care of you. He's the provider. He's the Savior. When we worry, we are not living our lives by faith in God as our provider and Savior. So the Lord goes on in this text, because he knows the battles within us. He goes on in his text to tell us why. Why can we trust in him? First of all, he reminds us that life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Now it's interesting here that the Greek word for life encompasses something more than just our body. It encompasses our soul. God is reminding us here, we are a unique aspect of his creation. Like no other, we have a body and a soul. And that gives us life beyond this one. When we focus ourselves on the things of this life, we lose our true identity and in God's creative we get so focused in on the body that we neglect the soul. And our souls, therefore, are strangled as we get involved in thinking we can take care of ourselves. Jesus addressed this matter in his Sermon on the Mount when he said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. When we seek our security in the things of this world, when our hearts are always looking for security in wealth, in health, or in friends, we'll struggle with anxiety. We will struggle and strangle ourselves from the life-giving, life-sustaining, life-fulfilling relationship Jesus wants for us. Jesus reminds us in our text, I'll take care of your physical needs. He shows us this by pointing out other aspects of his creation which are of, in a sense, of lesser value than us. He says, consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap, they have neither storehouses nor barns, 
and yet God feeds them. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon, all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. It's very significant that when Jesus talks to us about the fact he's going to take care of us, he looks to the lesser parts of his creation and how he takes care of them. It's interesting he uses the raven. I take care of the raven. That's interesting because in Mosaic law, the raven was considered an unclean animal. God says, if I'm going to take care of that unclean animal, Am I not going to take care of you, who I have cleansed and made holy through the blood of Jesus Christ? He makes the case by pointing to the lilies found in the field, growing wild. He says, look at them. How beautiful they are. And even when they die, what is done then is that the remains are used as fueling the fire to make goods. Jesus says, if I take care of that lily with its limited existence, won't I take care of you when I gave you a soul that can dwell with me eternally? These illustrations of Jesus are not meant to make us a lazy people. God does say, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. God's not suggesting here, be lazy. He's simply saying, entrust things to my care. You practice good stewardship. You live your life to my glory, but stay focused on me. Don't focus the in the, your life based upon you. Base your life upon me. God's telling us not to get involved in the rat race of life, but to live and work knowing God will provide everything we need, as Luther says, to support this body and life. Now we know this to be most certainly true. Because Jesus goes on in our text. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Let's just break down that statement once because it is the, a treasured statement in Scripture. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He calls us little flock. In Greek, that's a term of endearment. The Father is saying, I love you, I care for you, with all of my heart, and I will do what is right and just to bring you into my kingdom. He says, I give. He gives you the kingdom. The kingdom it's a free gift. It's not something we can earn. It's not something we deserve. God gives it to us. And then very significantly, he speaks of the Father's good pleasure. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Think about that for a moment. Jesus is saying the Heavenly Father did not give up His Son begrudgingly. He didn't give up His Son because He had to do it. What does the Bible say? God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. It was the pure love of God for you and me. He saw you and me and He loved us literally unto death. The writer of the book of Hebrews notes in chapter 12, verse 2, that for the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross. Now think about that statement. For the joy 
that was set before him. Does that sound like the Garden of Gethsemane? Does that sound like the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus was literally sweating drops of blood in anguish for that which was before him? He prayed and prayed and prayed again, Father, not my will but yours be done. But when he was certain of the Father's will, he went the way of the cross with joy. With joy. Because he saw your soul and my soul. And he saw the redemption he could bring us through the shedding of his blood and his resurrection from the grave. Oh yes, Jesus struggled with pain, with anguish. He knew the wrath of his heavenly Father, and yet he endured it all in joy because he knew, he knew it was bringing to us the forgiveness of sins and life everlasting. So Paul asked the question, in the suffering chapter of Scripture. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he graciously give us all things? Look to the cross, to the flock. See how much God loves you. Look to the ravens of the air, the lilies in the field, and see how much God cares for you. Dispel all anxiety and put your trust in the loving and caring Father who promises to be with you, to care for you, and through Christ lead you to eternity. Amen. And now may the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding keep our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. Let us now rise and confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles. Or the Nicene Creed, pardon me. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten as Father before all worlds, God, God, light of light, very God, very God, begotten and not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the Scriptures, and ascended to heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with the glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who is spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. I know that for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. And we kneel for prayer. Lord, we pray this day for our bodies and souls that we would truly entrust them to your care and recognize you as our Creator and Savior, the eternal caregiver of our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, the great physician of body and soul, we entrust to your loving 
and eternal care. Fred, Don, Remington, Stephanie, Mel, Kim, Betty, Bev, Marlene, Helen, Reverend Rasmus, Donnie, Reverend Carlson, Karen, Ray, Tim, Marlis, Harold, Dean, Alan, Ken, and Mary. Grant unto them your peace and your comfort. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord of life and death, we pray for your blessings upon the families of Dusty Ekman, Mark Richardson, and James Sailor, as you have called these people from this earth to dwell with you in glory. Bless the lives of the survivors with the beauty of your resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we commend to you all these things, as well as the matters that rest on our hearts personally this day. In the name of Jesus Christ, our living and reigning Savior. Amen. And you may rise. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. good, wise, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing.
you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the holy supper of your son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming, we may together with all your saints celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant unto you his peace. I guess we have a few announcements as I was looking at this. Uh, first of all, I, there's two meetings on um, gotta find this here. Two meetings on Tuesday. Uh, preschool Education Board meets at 6 and the Board of Trustees at 6.30. By the way, I want to thank, and be, I'm sure on behalf of Pastor Allemeyer and, and all the members of the congregation for all those who worked hard to get everything out of here and to get everything back in here so that we can be in our worship home once again. Uh, back at Bible study continues Thursday at 9. And uh, I remembered this last week, so I, I teased uh, Sonia. I said I read the bulletin. <laughs> the school, church office hours this week yet are going to be Wednesday and Thursday from 8 to 2. Okay, that's still the summer hours for this week. Uh, Wednesday and Thursday from 8 to 2. And then finally, and this is really a, a pretty big announcement, and that is there is a, a Calvary Ministry survey. If you've not gotten one and not filled one out, this has got to do with looking at this parish nurse ministry. And uh, having part of my responsibility being seeing some of the uh, shut-in people um, that could be a very uh, big asset. So there's a survey out there. They really want you to have that uh, filled in and put in the nurse's box in the East Hallway. The surveys are under the mailbox. And now we make our journey further as we leave this place. And where does our journey lead? By faith in Jesus Christ, the heavenly glory. This last hymn is, is kind of special to me because a number of years ago, we had a lady dying of cancer, and uh, she liked to sing, so I'd go into the hospital and sing a hymn or two with her. And we sang this hymn the night before she died. But she was so weak, she could not sing, I am but a stranger here. She simply kept saying, that is my home. We rejoice in that. Let us end with that message.